Okay, hey guys, what's up? I've already recorded this video one time, but the wind was so bad outside that I need to do the audio again. I myself get very frustrated when I listen to a video that has a ton of wind in it. So today, JFAC on small businesses, and I'm going to go through all the troubles that I faced as a small business and kind of let you know if you ever decide to start your own business here in Japan, some of the troubles you might face. This isn't me harping on or ranting about all the things that I faced. This is more just about an informational video like every JFAC is telling you some of the things you two might have to deal with when you try to open a small business here. My first little bit of advice is if you do try to start a business here in Japan, you should definitely try to make it on something you already know very well um, this is not a market that would allow for a lot of leniency as far as learning a craft while you open a business. That probably reigns true for opening a business almost anywhere in the world, but I remember thinking about that as I opened this. I had taught for 10 years before I opened mine and squirreled away money. Something else you should also do before you open your own business here. Save yourself enough to maybe save for two to three years minimum and after that I would say if you can even store just a tad bit more do it try to squirrel away as much as you can because you don't know how long you're gonna be in the red especially with times like they are now with coronavirus so I myself I squirreled away money for 10 years um, and that did not last me very long luckily I got out of the red <laughs> before all of it was gone but I did struggle quite a bit with using almost everything I had saved up by the time I finally got my footing in the market now again I had taught for 10 years so I thought going into this small school business that I started that I'd be an expert on how to run a school because I'd done it from all levels I had done Ikaiwa conversational English kids English Yochian international Yochian English ALT English every different type adults kids babies baby classes mommy and me classes I mean I had done it all at this point but guess what that doesn't teach you how to run a business so I still struggled and uh, unless you're some sort of master class businessman which I myself am not uh, you too might struggle when you first start. Don't expect it to run perfectly smooth no matter how good you are, no matter how much you have the market cornered. That being said, having the market cornered is a bit of an important thing to do. Um, number one, if you open a business here in Japan, if you are bringing a trade to Japan which cannot already be fulfilled by Japanese people, you are able to hire 90% Gaijin and 10% Japanese. Now the reverse reigns true if you open some sort of business that is already provided by Japan. So let's just take for example, although this would be crazy, <laughs> opening like a Japanese style hotel, ryokan and onsen, or a ramen shop, something like that. Why you would ever open that in Japan as a Gaijin, I don't know but you would have to hire the opposite, which is obviously 90% Japanese staff and only 10% Gaijin. This is mostly due to employment. Japan has a very, very low empo employment rate and um, that is something they like to keep. So of course they're gonna employ their own first before allowing you to bring your friends and your family over from another country to give them jobs first, which I think we can all agree is pretty understandable. I think any country operates this way. Now, with that said, let's move on to some of the struggles I faced at the beginning. Uh, number one was staff. Um, I started out uh, with a very high pay for staff, and I always wanted to pay my staff equal to or more than I made because I always feel like happy staff means good customer service and uh, great staff service too for everybody who's coming to your school what I found very quickly was I was not able to allot the hours that I wanted to give to an employee uh, at the beginning we only had two or three days that we were open because my school was not filled to the brim yet with students we were just getting our footing and because of that I could only offer anywhere from three to six hours a week sometimes only three hours and because of that, the only people I could offer this job were people who did not need a uh, livable income. 
And man, I really understand the struggle of employers to pay their employees after doing this um, because what I ended up having to pull from was the local college kids, which I have nothing against college kids. I was a college kid. Um, but this led to some staff not taking the job so serious. Now, I think this is a problem everybody probably deals with in any country. I'm not saying this is Japanese people. Um, they all work pretty hard, but the level of staff I had was either late all the time or couldn't show up to the job or make up an excuse or suddenly quit out of nowhere, which it's okay to quit. It's okay to show up late, but I need to know why. And I also don't need it to happen every single time you have work. Um, that got a little bit frustrating. So um, now I have a very astute staff that is very well versed in all forms of calling, talking to parents, uh, building a rapport with customers. And I'm very lucky, but it did take me a while to get to that point that I hired a staff that would fulfill the job. And I'm able to actually offer more now. I'm able to offer bonuses now too. Whenever they recruit a new student, I give them a kickback from the entry fee. And speaking of entry fees, that allows us to segue into the next problem. People digging for a bargain. I could not believe how many people would fight me to get an even lower price than we already had at my school. Now. Because my school had no overhead, it was an apartment I already owned and converted into a school, I didn't have a bunch of rent to pay. So I could make my prices, and my prices still are, very, very low. I am cheaper than GABA, I'm cheaper than NOVA, I'm cheaper than ECC. There is no company that can underbid me. On top of that, I don't have locked-in contracts. That's right, some companies have locked-in one-year contracts for your kid. If you start, you need to pay out that whole year, all right? Minimum, they usually have three to six month contracts that lock you in, or they have a group of points that you buy in a bundle, and you have to use all those points. So you pay ahead of time a huge chunk of money. I had an entrance fee, and usually that entrance fee covered things like insurance, uh, supplies for the student, and a processing fee for our school, and that was still very low and people would still try to ask me to just get rid of it they'd be like please i don't want to pay this and i'd be like you know do you want insurance for your kid like i have to cover them in my class if they get injured it's up to my school to pay for it and uh they would try to undercut the price per week uh they'd try to say can i send two students for one the price of one and it's i understand osaka people they're notorious for <laughs> digging for a bargain but when your school is already a bargain you can't bargain any lower um with that i can actually segue into the next part which was dealing with difficult parents i had some parents at the beginning that i realized very early on you have to be absolutely strict across the board with every rule you make at your school um I had one parent who decided they needed their kid picked up every single day from their school. So I'd have to pick them up from an elementary school and bring them over to my school. And I said, okay, for the first week, that's okay. Um, because maybe they don't know exactly which floor my school's on. Maybe they don't know exactly which door to knock on, how to ring the doorbell, maybe. But after the first week, I, I can't do this every time. And the reason I could not do it is number one, we have a small staff and I have other kids at the school. I don't wanna leave only one staff member with multiple kids. Number two, I have insurance for the inside of my school. That insurance covers any accident that could happen inside my school. I do not have any sort of insurance that covers every single place outside, the road outside, cars that could possibly hit the kid crossing the street, not that it has ever happened or that cars blaze through the area I'm in, but even somebody on a bicycle could hit their kid and that would be on me then and my school would be bankrupt. And it could even be something like the kid trips and falls because they're messing around with their friends right before they come to my school, they get severely injured. The parent could sue me if I said, I'm supposed to be there to pick up their kid. If I make a confirmation or sign a contract that I am picking up your kid and giving them some sort of transportation, then I am responsible for them to and from my school. I cannot do that. Now there are schools that do that, but even those schools, have identified buses that pick the kids up. They do not walk them in hand like my school did. And this parent just could not take that. They could not 
understand that. No matter how much I explained, look, your kid's great. I love them. They're a good student. I enjoy teaching them. They're covered by insurance. As soon as they walk into my school, they are not covered outside. I cannot promise their safety. Um, I cannot cover any medical costs that would happen to them if for some reason they got injured on the way to my school. I can only cover what happens inside. And that's how almost every school works. Even those that have some sort of transportation like a bus that delivers them, that bus has insurance on it to cover all the kids inside. So couldn't do it. Now, uh, the other problems I had, now I made a list so that I could read through, was my first flyer com company that I used was a scam. Unbelievable. Um, I wish I remembered the name, but they're already bankrupt, so I don't have to worry about it. Um, apparently, the first flyer company I was using, they delivered my first batch of flyers, and the next two batches after that, they just kind of threw in the trash. Um, now, you're probably wondering, like, Scott, how would you know if they delivered your flyers or not? Well, we'd have them delivered within a certain radius. When you have flyers delivered, you select the radius that you want them delivered within. We'd choose, like, you know, something like... 1600 kilometers within the area of our school because usually we didn't get students from any farther away and we then knew people who lived within the apartment complexes in each area and we'd ask each one oh hey did you see our new flyer that got delivered because we knew it's supposed to be in every single one of their mailboxes the first time we did we found a lot of people and they're like yeah we saw your new flyer it looks great it's awesome the second time they'd be like no are you sure you put flyers out just recently and we'd be like yeah we just had them delivered just this last saturday no, never saw it. Second batch came out. No one ever saw it. So the first time my wife calls and she says, look, um, no one seems to have gotten the flyer. Are you sure you sent it out? And they're like, what? This company was so aggressive. They're like, what? Are you calling us liars? And it's just like, dude, no. I mean, I can ask around at the different apartments, but I've already asked a few people and they've said, no, nobody's seen anything. We went around and asked nine different people at nine different apartments that were all within the area, the radius that we asked for them to be delivered. And we even told them, look out for our flyer so they could let us know that it got delivered okay. Nobody got it. The second time, too. We got back to them again and uh, no, no. They hadn't delivered it. Um, I guess they had just taken the flyers that we had had printed and dropped them in the trash. And that was that. Including my own apartment, I included in the delivery area. And I didn't even get a flyer at my own apartment. So later we found out from a friend of a friend, a great flyer company that does our flyers now. And that guy who runs that flyer company, he laughed when I told him which company I'd use. And he said, oh, yeah, they've gone bankrupt twice already. They've had all kinds of trouble. Live and learn, I guess. I mean, at least I didn't use them for multiple years. <sighs> Next up, and probably the last little thing I'm going to cover is Aiken. Now, if you don't know what Aiken is, Aiken is a entrance level exam for different English levels and proficiencies. It's kind of like the Japanese language proficiency test, the JLPT, but it is for English in Japan. It is made by Japan, and it is wrong. It does not use English the correct way in any form. Now, I know there's multiple different rules and all different types. You know, there's Oxford English, there's HML English, there's British English, there's American English, and this did not cover the rules of any of those. In fact, Aiken does not know how to use capitalization. Any book or workbook or worksheet that I used, they didn't properly capitalize any place that they would write within their sentences. They didn't use commas right. They would use weird comma splices or start sentences with but and and. They would use semicolons in odd ways that didn't make any sense. And I got a lot of my English education in Northern America, and I had a very strict teacher who was strict about everything from prepositions to helping verbs, all of that. And my mother wanted to major in English and only changed her major at the last second and was a stickler. I mean, she would read my reports over and over and mark every little red spot down that she could, that there was some sort of error, and I'd have to go back and correct it. So I learned the rules of English very, very well. And Aiken breaks all of them, but you're still having to teach Aiken as an entrance-level exam. So you're literally forced by Japan to teach their book about the way they've written English, a language that Japan is one of the worst countries at speaking and writing and reading, 
so that you can completely teach it wrong to a kid. It it was very frustrating because every second you find an error, you want to stop and be like, okay, look, they want you to learn it this way for the test, but when you go to a college in America, please never write it this way. Because I didn't want them coming back to me being like, hey, Scott, you know, you told me to use a comma here and here in the Aiken book. Well, what's going on? My teachers marked everything wrong. Aiken, man, the book has so many problems, so many errors. It does not have natural speech, and it does this weird jump. There's Aiken level 5, which is the easiest level, to up to Aiken level 1. 5 to 3, Aiken covers very basic English. It's very basic remedial things and kind of almost what I call robot English, like, hello, nice to meet you. My name is Nantoka. I am Nantoka years old, which nobody ever speaks like. And then suddenly at two, it jumps to extremely esoteric English in words that are just like internet, medical, science-based English. That is just this giant leap out of nowhere. So going from level three, all my kids would pass. When they would get to level two, they'd be like, Scott, I cannot pass level two. And when I went through all these books, and I've got every single Aiken book you need to teach it, every workbook you need to teach it, the official tests that they've used before where they've just mixed the questions up, it made no sense. And just some of the questions were just so outdated and obsolete. It would talk about using the internet on a phone that wasn't a smartphone it never updated with how the internet had worked it would start using dial-up to talk about modern internet which people haven't used in ages and so these kids who i was teaching had never even heard of a dial-up modem so when i would teach them the computer aspect of the class they just be like what what, are you, what is this what are you talking about because they never kept up to date now the new thing that is coming out for schools is called GTEC. Apparently, GTEC is going to be the new test to replace Aiken in all the college entrance exams and everything like that. But GTEC, it, <laughs> it's insane. It, it's so incredibly hard English that it makes Aiken all look like baby English. Even level one Aiken looks like baby English compared to GTEC. It's like Japan went from barely being able to speak with Aiken to trying to speak on a college level before they even learned the language. And GTEC has questions like how to apply to classes online for a college and all the internet lingo that it deals with. It doesn't have any necessary barriers to get through to get to that point. I think those are important things to teach and keeping up to date on language is very important, but you need to learn the basics first and GTEC doesn't have that. So I'm really stuck in a frustrating place because kids need these tests to get a good standing on an interview, on a college entrance exam. It can get them multiple credits before they even get to college in Japan. But both of these tests are just horribly skewed. So those are some of the struggles I dealt with. Um, I guess as of now, I've, you know, I've been in the black for about two years now. Um, what were the lessons that I learned? I learned that when you teach English, don't ever try to copy the way any other school teaches. Don't try to copy their worksheets. Don't try to copy their cards. Not that I tried to do that, but what I did try to do was use the things I had already learned from these other schools and use them at my school. I found out they just didn't work. That me using my own custom tools worked far better than trying to copy and manipulate the tools I had learned from the past. So making my own cards, making my own workbooks, making my own worksheets, this is what I had to start doing. I couldn't use the past books I had used because none of these books were being updated. Probably the only book I've ever seen for early ESL English learners was Pop Tropica that kept up to date. And aside from that, every other book, even the books that they use at local elementary schools that used to be called Hey Friends. Now it's called, Kenny, what's the new book called? What? Your new English book for elementary school. Mm -hmm. It was called Hey Friends in the past. Now it's called... Same. It's still called Hey Friends? Oh, okay. It's still called Hey Friends. It's Oxford English based. I found a ton of mistakes in it already. Um, you know, luckily... <laughs> He, my, my kid lives with an English speaker, so he gets the correct English and I correct him when he does make mistakes. But there is a huge lack of verified correct English. Look, I'm not saying Oxford-based English is better than American-based English. I'm not saying, you know, the Queen's English is better than American English. I'm just saying if you're going to teach English, 
Pick your roles and stick to them. Be consistent. Some of these books switch back between like, here's how you spell uh, the word favorite. It's the British spelling. Oh, and also, here's the American spelling. I'm not going to tell you which one either of these is. Figure it out for yourself. You can't do that to kids, to little kids. They, they see the word color and they see the word color with you and they're like, is this the same word? I think that's pretty understandable. So that was some of the struggles I dealt with. Now, like I said, making my own custom tools really helped a lot. I've used Minecraft and Minecraft in the classroom and education Minecraft. This worked wonders for my school. I'm going to tell you right now, if you can get computers into your school and I've got three very fast laptops and a fast desktop that I can line all the kids up on to have them using a computer at the same time, maybe switch stations between if I have more than four kids at a time. And it is smooth, man. The kids are having so much fun that they don't even realize they're learning. If you can make English into an art lesson, that makes it so much more fun. Arts and crafts, there's so many downloadable things. So that being said, you should also get yourself a decent printer so you can print these things out. It is a great investment to make if you're going to open your own school. Get yourself a professional corporate printer. I've worked at some of these jobs before where I guess the owner was stingy and didn't want to spend anything and their school was dull, boring, and could not mix up the lessons because we couldn't even do things like simply print worksheets correctly or print new cards or print arts and crafts or cutouts or anything like that. Get yourself and invest in a wonderful printer. It has done so much for my school. And even that, I only have one more payment on and it's mine forever. And it's a corporate level printer. The only thing I got to pay for is the ink cartridges and whew, those are expensive. Um, I guess that's my little bit of advice. I'm sure there's a ton more I could cover, but this video would reach an unreasonable length. So if you have more questions, put them in the comments below. Hopefully I can help you with anything you might want to open. Some things I would say stay away from though is unless you've got some sort of corner market or niche market on food or bars, those are really hard to keep open in Osaka, at least, as far as I know. I've heard 60% of them fail in the first year. So that's not a line I would suggest going into. Also, I wouldn't really ever try to compete with Japan um, as far as anything they put out. Um, if it's any sort of apprenticeship that somebody's already done, uh, maybe you've done your own version of it in your country, unless your country is really, really well known for it and way better than Japan at it, for example, I've seen some people open leather shoes that they learned how to make in Italy. They can outdo the Japanese with that because they've just got a master craftsmanship on it and they can totally spin the market on it. But unless you've got something like that going, don't try to compete with Japan in their own markets that they already pwned to the max. You're probably not going to succeed. You're already seen as kind of the outlier and they would think most Japanese customers would think, why would I go to a foreign source when I can get it within my own country and usually for cheaper? So, and on top of it, I know I can speak Japanese to them if they have any kind of problem or customer service question. So, like I said, if you got any more questions, put them in the comments down below. I hope you helped uh, a little bit by this uh, JFAC today. If you did, can you give me a like? That'd be cool. Can you subscribe if you're not already subscribed? Until next time, I am unrested and I will talk to you again soon.